What's up guys, back with another educational video. This week we're talking about terkesterone. Now, every time I do a Q&A on my Instagram, I get this question at least half a dozen times. What do I think of terkesterone? What do you think of terkesterone? Let's get into the research first and then I can tell you my answer. So I did a literature search of terkesterone and muscle growth. And I found one article written in Russian that I could not decipher and another article that really had nothing to do with my question. Now, terkesterone is a type of ectosteroid, which is found in plants and also bugs and is responsible for molting and other developmental processes in bugs. And some people have hypothesized that, hey, since this is basically kind of a steroid in bugs, maybe it'll have effects in mammals. Even though I couldn't find anything on terkesterone, I did find quite a bit of research on ectosteroids. And terkesterone in particular is an analog of an ectosteroid called 20-hydroxyectosterone. There is one study I found where they gave ectosteroids, they saw increases in muscle mass and strength. And I'm sure everyone's saying, well, that solves it, right? I get really nervous when I see studies that exist in isolation that show improvements in muscle mass and strength with absolutely no proposed mechanism. And the reason I say that is because we know for a fact that ectosteroids do not bind to human steroid receptors. Therefore, if it is influencing muscle growth and strength, it is doing so through a mechanism that is independent of human steroid hormones. Again, if it's promoting the accrual of lean body mass, we would expect to either see an increase in protein synthesis or a decrease in protein breakdown, which would affect net protein balance, allowing for increased deposition of muscle mass. There's that one study in humans. And again, you can find studies like this for other things where, hey, look, we took this random supplement and these people got bigger and stronger. As I have told you guys previously many times, I do not get excited about single studies, not anymore at least, because I have seen this all too often where a study finds this unbelievable outcome in isolation and it's never replicated. So keep in mind, one, this study was not using terkesterone in particular, and two, this study exists alone, and when they measured muscle mass, they used bioelectrical impedance, basically one of those handheld monitors. Those monitors are not very accurate. Now, it might measure the relative change with precision, however, to my knowledge, bioelectrical impedance does not directly measure muscle mass. It'll measure lean body mass. I'm not aware of any bioelectrical impedance unit other than the four compartment models, which I don't think the one they were using here was a four compartment model, that measures skeletal muscle mass. And even then, the ones that I have seen, I've not been really impressed with their accuracy. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, I should point out that this study also looked at these subjects' testosterone levels their luteinizing hormone levels and found no difference. They did find a small but significant increase in IGF-1 from a terkesterone. However, it's really important to point out that circulating IGF-1, systemic IGF-1, is not anabolic. It is the autocrine and paracrine IGF-1, also known as MGF, which is anabolic. So again, really not giving a good mechanism for how this is influencing muscle growth. There is a study from a lab I do trust from a person named Tracy Anthony who actually came out of the same lab that I came from, but she came about four years earlier than me. And now she's a professor at Rutgers. She has done really, really good research for a really long period of time. Her lab took 20-hydroxyectosterone, which remember is an analog for terkesterone, and they looked at its effects on mTOR protein synthesis and mTOR signaling in mice. Now, people say, well, that's in mice. Yes, but rodent models for human protein metabolism have been shown to be pretty good. In most cases, the results do transfer over, and that was the case for my research, which was in rats, which was later validated in humans. 
Now, again, it's in mice. But there are studies in isolation, again, showing improvements in mice performance measures from exercise from ectosterone. So again, we should expect to see changes in protein synthesis. Not only did they not see changes in protein synthesis, they did not see an increase in mTOR activity or any mTOR signaling with administration of 20-hydroxyectosterone. And actually, when they gave leucine or 20-hydroxyectosterone or both of them together, what they found was that leucine increased muscle protein synthesis and mTOR activity, ectosterone did not, and when you gave ectosterone with leucine, it actually attenuated the anabolic effects of leucine. I'll say that again. It actually reduced the anabolic effects of leucine. So if you're gonna argue that ectosterone is anabolic, then I would like to know what your proposed mechanism of action is because it does not appear to increase testosterone. It does not bind to steroid receptors. It does not appear to increase muscle protein synthesis or mTOR activity. And I'm aware of no research showing it to drastically decrease muscle protein degradation because if you're going to increase net protein balance and what you're giving doesn't increase muscle protein synthesis or may even decrease it, then you'd expect to see a massive inhibition of muscle protein degradation, which I'm aware of no data showing that. Now going back to my thoughts on tercasterone. Guys, this stuff isn't new. Maybe a slew of research will come out in the next five years showing that this stuff is the latest and greatest. But it's been around for 20 years. When I first got into the industry, there were all kinds of these ads for ectosterone in muscle magazines. It was gonna be the next big thing. And somehow, over time, it went away. You know what didn't go away? Creatine, whey protein. You know, the stuff that actually works. Am I leaving out all chances that this stuff could do something? No, I mean, I suppose it's possible. But the stuff that works sticks around. It doesn't go in and out in cycles. And unfortunately, what you're gonna find is in this industry, people like to resurrect supplements literally from the dead and parade them around as being new. There are gonna be supplement company owners who argue with me on this, that's fine. They'll cite the literature I probably just talked about saying, hey, look, it increases muscle mass in humans. And what I will say is, hey, if a bunch more studies come out showing an increased muscle mass, not only will I retract this video, but I'll probably start taking it myself, to be honest. Uh, if it's not influencing your natural testosterone, not binding to sex hormone receptors, then perhaps it is the greatest thing ever. But I feel like if it was, and it was causing these massive differences in muscle mass, it'd probably be something like creatine that everybody is taking for the most part. Except creatine, like everybody knows it's good, at least most people know it's good. Uh, it only increases muscle mass very, very modestly. But like I said, it's been around for a long time, so it's boring. And people can't really make that much money off of it. So what is my advice on tercasterone or other ectosteroids? I would save your money at this point, and I would leave them to the bugs. You know, who it's actually for. But again, maybe I'll be proven wrong over time. And if I am, like I said, I'll be happy to make a video retraction. But I kind of don't think I will. So, if you guys want links to the studies I discussed, check out the description. Also, if you are interested in any of our educational materials, our books are in the description. And my own supplement line, no, we do not sell ectosterone. We sell really boring stuff that works. <laughs> so, if you guys are interested in that, you can click the links in the description. Hope you liked the video, and I'll catch you next week.